Love is not convenient. Love is a commitment. And Jesus demonstrated that to us. You want to live the truth? We need to have our love directed in the right direction. I'm excited that it is Youth Month. Today we get to look at another young man in the Bible. And I want us to read this. All scripture, read this with me. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. If this is the truth, God's word, Jesus' is truth, what is our application? Truth, we need to live it and we need to pass it. And we're going to look at this amazing young man, Timothy. Who was Timothy? Look at Paul writing to Timothy. Paul, read with me. An apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus who is our hope. He's introducing himself. That Paul, he's saying, one of the apostles. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace and mercy from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. How does he call Timothy? My true child in the faith. Paul mentored Timothy. Paul discipled Timothy. The first time you hear about Timothy is in the book of Acts, chapter 16. And it tells us that there was this young man who loved the Lord, who was a devout follower of Jesus. But he gives us a little bit of his background. His father was Greek and his mother was a Jew. His mother was a believer. And Paul started taking Timothy on his trips. And Paul started pouring his life into Timothy. He was passing it on. Now, what was Paul telling Timothy in the book of Timothy? Very similar to what's going on in our day and age, where there's lots of trends that we don't know if are true or not true. Many times they're not true. They contradict the Bible. Look at what Look at what Paul tells Timothy. I urge you, upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus. So he's telling Timothy, you stay in Ephesus. You pastor the church in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrine, not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. A lot of false teaching was going on in Ephesus. A lot of trends. And Paul was telling Timothy, you need to go there and you need to speak the truth. You live the truth and you pass it on. Now, I want you to imagine you're Timothy. And what do you know about Timothy? One, he was young. He was sickly. We see that in chapter 5. There was some ailment that he was dealing with. And we hear that he's also quite timid. How many of you have insecurities in life? Raise your hand. I believe we all do. And look at what Paul tells Timothy, this young leader that's given this responsibility to pastor this church, to lead this believers in Ephesus, which was a major, major city back in the day. He tells Timothy, and this is our memory verse together. Let's read it. Let no one look down on your youthfulness. So whatever it is, your insecurity, for, for Timothy, it's like, don't let anybody look down on your youthfulness. But rather, in what? In speech, in conduct, in love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. He was telling Timothy, hey, you may be young. And whatever it is you're going through, you may be insecure, but understand who you are. You are God's child. And instead of dwelling on that, on that thing, him being young, in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, in your purity, show yourself as what it means to be a Christian. What is this verse talking about? It's talking about our first point. You need to know the truth. The truth is found in the Bible. Truth comes from Jesus. Not just know it in your head, but touch your heart with me. You have to what? You have to live it. You have to live it. And how do you live it? In your speech. 
what is a trend in our world today? The trend is speak your mind without filter. Freedom of expression means saying whatever you feel. Do you see that? Do you see people posting whatever they want to post? Do you find people saying things, however tactless it may be, even gossiping about other people? Because they say, this is, I'm speaking what's on my mind. That is the trend. And you see that more and more, in, not just in social media, but in interactions. Now, what does the Bible say? What is the truth? And how do we live it out? The truth is, God tells us, let no, read this with me, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the what? The need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. You know, the book of James tells us that there is death and there is what? Life in the power of the what? In the tongue. Does it take effort to compose a message? Yes. Does it take effort to post online? Does it take effort to talk to somebody? It does. So why would you you waste that effort and say something that will cost death when you have the opportunity to build life? To live the truth is to build life when you talk to people, when you encourage people. How many of you have received a phone call at just the right time. You were discouraged, you were down. Raise your hand. But you receive a text message. Somebody encouraged you. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but I've known of people who have not killed themselves because somebody called them. Somebody spoke life into their situation. Somebody messaged them. You want to live the truth? Use your mouth to build into people's life. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. That's what Paul's telling us. Live the truth. Not just in your speech. What's the second thing? In your conduct. By the end of this message, you're going to have memorized the, the, the passage. Right? Don't let anybody look down on your youthfulness, but in your speech, in your what? Conduct. What is the trend today? You live your truth. Do what makes you happy regardless of what God thinks or regardless of how it affects others. Is that a reality? Yeah. You do what you want to do. Live your truth. You conduct yourself whatever way you want. You want to be boisterous when you should be quiet. Who cares about everybody else? Just have fun and do what you want to do. And that is not what the Bible tells us, right? The Bible tells us, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. God created all of us uniquely. He's given us personality. And God enables you to live out your personality in a way that would glorify him. Right? It's not, I'm going to live my life whatever way I want. Regardless of what God thinks. Regardless of how it affects other people. The truth is, you want to live it out? The Bible says, think about others as more important than yourself. So not just in your speech, not just in your conduct, what's the next thing? In your love. What's the trend today? Love is about self-fulfillment. Leave when it no longer serves you, right? If it doesn't work, it's too messy, just get out of there. But what is the truth? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag, and it's not arrogant. And Jesus tells us, there is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. Love is not convenient. Love is a commitment. And Jesus demonstrated that to us. You want to live the truth? We need to have our love directed in the right direction. Because even as early as... Uh, Paul and Timothy's time. Look at what Paul tells Timothy. Realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. One of the last days. Now, these are the last days. The last days are from the time that Jesus left, ascended into heaven, up to when he comes back. These are the last days. So as early as um, when Jesus had already ascended, 
He's talking about the last days, then. He's talking about now. What is the mindset now? He says, in the last days, difficult times will come. It's going to be difficult. Why? Men will be lovers of what? Self. Lovers of money. Boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. All the children in the house, raise your hand. All of you that were once children, raise your hand. That's all of us, right? But you know the context. When you're living in the house of your parents, here, the days will come. Children, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. Isn't it amazing? He's describing our day and age. Unloving, irreconcilable. What's that? I've done my part. I can't, I can't fix this anymore. You are too toxic, so I cancel you. I cancel, cancel. That's happening today, irreconcilable. Malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of what? Pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Who created love? God did. Remember in 1 John, God is love. He created love. Love is a wonderful, beautiful thing. But when love becomes misdirected, when our love becomes greater, when our love for someone or something or yourself becomes greater than your love for God, something is off. And we do not live the truth. We self-sabotage. Whatever it is that you love most will actually destroy you if it's not God. And so God reminds us the root of all of these, all of these kind of behavior is the love of self, love of money, love of pleasure, rather than love of God. So if you want to live the truth in the aspect of love, who should you love most? Love God. Look what he says, holding to a form of godliness. So these guys, there's a sense of religiosity. They, they feel they're godly, although they have denied its power. Haven't experienced the true power of Jesus in their life. If a form of godliness avoids such men as these. How do we live the truth? Touch your heart again. What's the message? Live the truth. In your speech, in your what? Conduct, in your love, and now faith. What's the trend today? Believe in yourself. You heard that? Above all else, you are your own source of strength and success. You control your destiny. Believe in yourself. How much do you really control? Not much. You think you can control. That's why we become very controlling. When things don't happen our way, then it's a bad day. Because it didn't go as what we planned the day to be. It was out of our control. And we try to live a life where we control everything. But what does Jesus tell us in the book of Proverbs? Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. To have faith is to trust in who? God. Last week. But even if not... You still have faith in the way that you and I make decisions, in the way that we live our life, we can reflect true faith in Jesus Christ, not in ourself. So not just in our speech, not just in our conduct, not just in love, not just in faith. What's the fifth thing? In our purity. What is the trend today when it comes to purity? Anything goes if it feels good. Moral boundaries? Huh. Old-fashioned. Marriage, old-fashioned. Everybody's doing it. Right? That's the mindset. Why can't I have sex? Why can't I watch pornography? Why can't I engage in homosexuality? There is a relativism, a blurring of truth. And if you are in a secular school, one of the biggest challenges for kids today is 
everybody's doing it. Isn't that right? Everybody's doing it. And since everybody's doing it, why can't I do it? There's a strong pull to follow the trend of the world. But what does God tell us? He says, flee from sexual immorality. You know, God created sex. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. He created it in the context of marriage. He said, outside of marriage, you have to flee it. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Sex is not the ultimate thing. It's a wonderful thing in marriage. But don't believe the lie or the trend of the world that says if you don't have sex, you're missing out, you're lacking. You cannot have true joy, you can't have pleasure. That's not true. God says you follow my design. Follow my design for family, male and female, husband and wife. Follow my design when it comes to your gender. Your gender. Who are you? Are you male or are you female? And that's when you experience true fulfillment in life. Why should I be pure? Well, let me answer. Paul tells us, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, this is why, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for what? For honor. Sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. How many of you want to be used by God? I believe all of you want to be used by God. That's why you're here. That's why on a Sunday, you're here, you're worshiping, or you're, you're worshiping online. Because you want to be used by God. God tells us, you want to be used by me? You have to sanctify yourself. Keep yourself pure. He gives you the power to do it. But you do have to make decisions. You have to make choices. Are you going to live the truth or are you just going to know the truth in your mind? I want to encourage you guys, all of you, young, middle age, uh, not so old, <laughs> and the older. At every season of life, God wants to use us. But he uses people that are set apart, that are holy. We are in the world, but we are not what? Of the world. And that's how we live truth. He tells us not just why we should be holy, but how to be holy. Flee. There's one way to be holy when it comes to sexual sin. Sexual sin is so powerful. Pornography, powerful. All of that. Sexual sin is so powerful. How do you fight it? Flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. It's not just flee, but it's pursue. You need both. When I was growing up and I struggled with pornography, my dad told me, son, I pray that you learn to love God more than you love sin. He said, sometimes we focus so much on the sin that we keep thinking about the sin. He says, you focus on who Jesus is, who he is. I didn't fully understand that back then, but the older I've, I've grown, the more I understood what he meant. When you love God and you experience that joy, that pornography or sexual sin or whatever pleasure you get from that, you know that's just temporary and it's just artificial. Pursue with who? Righteousness, faith, love, and peace with who? Those who call on the Lord. That's what a D group is. If you are not part of a D group, I know a lot of you a while ago, raise your hands, you are part of a D group. A D group is a small group where you can be authentic. You can be honest. You can, you can call each other and say, brother, I'm really struggling. Or I fell. And that D group will remind you of who you are. You are God's son. You are, not, you are not meant to live a life of defeat. God has paid the price of your sin. There is victory and you encourage each other. You need people in your life. One of the trends today, which I didn't mention, is self-sufficiency. I don't need nobody. You need people in your life to encourage you. Why not open your life up to people? We've got nothing to prove. We need each other and we need Christ 
to have victory in this area. That's how you experience victory. You flee, you do your part, but you pursue with people who are loving the Lord. And then he tells us, what's the message? Live the truth, right? How else do you live the truth? He says, refuse foolish and ignorant speculation, knowing that they produce quarrels. Choose your battles. Some battles are just not worth getting into the conversation with. It leads to quarrel. The Lord's bondservant must not be what? Quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong. Let's not be quarrelsome people. Let's be kind. Let's be patient. Have you been wronged? If you haven't been wronged yet, one day you will be wronged. And I'll say, welcome to this world. Because everybody who's lived long enough has been wronged. He says, when you're wrong, be patient. Why? With gentleness. Say this with me. Gentleness. Correcting. How do we correct? With arrogance. I'm right. You're wrong. And then we tell them what's wrong with them. No gentleness. When you and I are not gentle, we fall into the trap of Satan. We make it that much harder for the person to repent. Look what it says here. Those who are in opposition, it perhaps God may grant them repentance. Who, who softens the heart of people? God does. But he uses you and me. And if we're gentle in the way that we approach it, we give an opportunity. You know, somebody told me the other day, he's like, bro, the gospel is so simple. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We need a savior. He says, why don't people get it? I'm like, bro, there is a blindness. The Bible talks about a blindness, a veil over people who don't have a relationship with Christ. And in our harshness, we contribute to the blindness. Gentle, leading to the knowledge of the truth that they may come, read this with me, to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. What's a snare? It's more than a trap. It's like a super enticing trap that gets you. And a lot of people are wrestling with unforgiveness, bitterness, pride, arrogance. They're ensnared by the devil. Having been what? Held captive by him to do his will. What's the message today? Truth. You have to what? Live it. Now you have the opportunity to touch your neighbor. Pass it. Tell them. Pass it. Not just live it, but what? Pass it. You have to make the pass. Right? Basketball players, you need to be able to know how to pass the ball. Right? In the Christian life, we need to pass it on. We can't just hold it to ourselves. But you can't pass what you don't have. So as you live it, you can pass it. And where do we see that? Look at Timothy chapter 2. He says, you therefore, my son, be what? Strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. How many of you honestly get discouraged? We all get discouraged, right? And we get discouraged because a lot of times we rely on our own strength. That's how I felt growing up. I told my mom, mom, I can't be a Christian. I'm always making mistakes. She's like, son, you're trying to do it on your own strength. The reality is it's impossible to be a Christian on your own strength. But in the Lord, he says, be strong, where? In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And he tells us what to do. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. So what Paul was teaching wasn't something in secret. People knew that he was talking about Jesus. That there was this person, Jesus, who rose again from the dead. They were, he was teaching Jesus. He says, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust. That's what it means to pass on. And trust these to what? Faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If you look at here, there's Paul entrusting to Timothy, entrusting to faithful men who will also entrust to what? Others. How many generations? Four generations. Do you have Timothy in your life? Is there somebody you're passing it on? You may be living it. Are you passing it? You need to do both. And you need to look for people who are what? Faithful, able to teach. I love this verse. It's 
in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says, I am mindful, this is Paul speaking, of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, Eunice. Who was the mother of Timothy? Eunice. Who was his grandmother? Louis. And this faith, which first dwelt in his grandmother and mother, I am sure that it is in you as well. Who, who passed it on to Timothy? His mother, his grandmother. How come there's no mention of the father? Maybe the father was not a Christian. But you know, I take heart of this passage. Why? There are many single parents today. Many. Many. And sometimes single parents believe the lie that I can't pass it on because I don't have my spouse. You know what? Be like the grandmother. Be like Eunice. Don't forget your children. Pass it on to your children. And he goes on, suffer hardship with me, 2 Timothy chapter 2, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Paul was in jail. He saw a lot of soldiers. What is the primary responsibility or goal of the soldier? Who is he going to please? His commander. He follows orders. And Paul is reminding Timothy, the Christian life, Jesus, he says here, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Who enlisted us? Jesus did. He called us. But what is the reality? There will be hardship. There will be hardship. It's not a walk in the park. He says, remember the soldier. He's focused. Does he mean you're not, you're not going to uh, work anymore? No, you still have to put food on the table. You still have to pay your electric bill. But what is most important in your life? Remember, the misdirected love. When you seek God first, his kingdom and his righteousness, Matthew 6, it helps you prioritize the other aspects of life. You still need to work. But don't get entangled. Don't get lost in building your career. Keep living for Jesus. And what? Pass it on. Anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Can I have all the athletes raise their hands? If you're an athlete, you play for a team. What is important as an athlete? You have to play by the rules. If you don't play by the rules, what happens? You disqualify yourself. Guys, as you and I pass it on, you're living the truth. You're passing it on. Are there things that can disqualify you? Of course there are. How many times have you read of these people who fall into sin. It's very heartbreaking. And I pray that we, through the power of God's grace, will be faithful to the end. You can't keep your eyes on people because no matter how much you respect and look at a person, sometimes people fall. Keep your eyes on Jesus. But you yourself, as an athlete, don't disqualify yourself. As a servant of God, do not disqualify yourself. That's what he's saying. As you pass it on, there's going to be temptation, extra temptation. And he says here, the hardworking farmer, any farmers in the house? Not so many. I can't see if you are. But what, what about the farmer? He's what? Hardworking, ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. How is the farmer described? Hardworking. Unlike the soldier who has a nice uniform, unlike the athlete who maybe people see competing, who sees the farmer? No one. It's not a glamorous job. You're under the heat. It is hard work. As you pass it on, it requires what? Hard work. There is a lot of work to it, but it's worth it. Consider what I say, Paul says, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. You know, you read, you, read, you read the Bible, you listen to sermons, take time to reflect and to meditate. That's what it means to consider. Consider. Think about these things. And who gives you understanding? The Lord does. And when you dis are discouraged, and when you are tired, verse 8, read it with me. Remember, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. What does that tell you? Supernatural. 
He really is who he says he is. He rose from the dead. He said, remember, Jesus Christ, he rose from the dead. Paul saw the risen Christ. What else? Descendant of David. He was, he was fully man. He was from the lineage of David. You can trace his genealogy according to my gospel. It's not his gospel. He just, he just preached the gospel so much that he, he owned it. But Paul tells us what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? This is the gospel, that Christ died on the sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. It's the same gospel. So this is Jesus. He says, remember this person, Jesus, when you're tired, for which I suffer hardship. Paul says, I go through everything I went through. The injustice, the being in jail, even to imprisonment as a criminal. He wasn't a criminal. He was wronged. But the word of God is not in prison. He said, remember Jesus. You cannot hold the word of God. We have God's word today. Even if we live in a world that hates God's word, we have it. And he says this, for this reason, I endure what? All things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Are you chosen? Yes. It is God's grace that saves us. Did somebody share the gospel with you? Yes. You need to share the gospel. You need to do your part. Paul says, I endure all of it. I remember Jesus and I do it for him. The Bible says, don't let anyone look down on your youthfulness. Young people, you can be used by God mightily today. You have to live the truth. To pass the truth. Us older ones, don't take for granted the life that God has given you, the time he's given you with your loved ones. Pass it on. You live it. And it's not in wanting to be great. What makes us great is Jesus living in and through you and me. So let's walk with him. So as we close, what is the message today? Truth. Live it. Pass it. And if we do that, we can be like the Apostle Paul, who at the end of his life said this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing, there is a crown. The best is yet to come. Let's not live for the short term. Let's live for eternity. Live the truth. Pass it on. It's gonna be difficult. You will suffer. There will be hardships. There will be days that you may even fall. If you're an athlete and you fell down, what do I tell you? Get back up, brother. Don't stay out of the race. Get back in the race. You may have sinned. Get up. Run the race. Allow the Holy Spirit be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at times you just have to do the work like the farmer. What's the message? Live the truth. Pass the truth. Heavenly Father, thank you. Jesus, you are the truth. And if there's anybody in this room or anybody that's worshiping online that is willing to repent, you said, Lord, that when we repent, that's what opens up our life to you. And I know it's your grace, Jesus. And there's no accident why we are here right now or why people are listening to this right now. So if you're that person and you want Jesus in your life, you want that assurance, of eternal life in Christ. Pray with me simply like this. Jesus, I admit I have sinned against you. I have lived my life my way, but I humble myself before you. I repent of my sin. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life, to be my Lord, to be my savior, to be my master. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for all my sins. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. 
and for your promise of eternal life. Please make me into the kind of person you want me to be. And Jesus, for the rest of us that have a relationship with you, Father, help us to live the truth in the power of the Holy Spirit and help us to pass it on. As difficult as challenging life may get, help us not never to lose sight of what matters most in this life. And that's you, Jesus, and that people around us would also know you. We commit to you, everybody here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.